This short video lecture is on the generation of precipitation by rising expansion and cooling of air and the formation of clouds by condensation. Two main processes are described. Precipitation starts when large water droplets or ice crystals fall to the earth due to gravity. In many clouds, the water droplets or ice crystals are not heavy enough to overcome the updraft of the air, which is the vertical upward movement of the air as described in the short lecture on cloud formation. Also, precipitation may evaporate as it falls into the warmer air below the clouds. Thus, in order for precipitation to reach the ground, water droplets or ice crystals must become large and heavy enough to counteract both the effect of updraft and evaporation. There are two main processes that generate precipitation in warm clouds and in cold clouds. In warm clouds, clouds with temperatures above freezing point, turbulent atmospheric mixing can cause water droplets of varying size to grow through a collision coalescence process as schematized in the left part of this figure. By collision of rising and falling droplets in a cloud, the droplets coalesce to produce larger and larger droplets. Eventually, the droplets are large and heavy enough to overcome the air currents in the cloud and the updraft beneath it. This method of raindrop production is the primary mechanism in tropical regions. It typically produces drizzle, a fairly steady light rain. Cold clouds, clouds with temperatures below freezing point, contain both ice crystals and supercooled water droplets. Supercooled water is liquid water that is chilled below its freezing point without it becoming solid. As with condensation, the processes of freezing and deposition also need nuclei in order to get started. As freezing nuclei, the term includes deposition, ice crystals themselves are very efficient in attracting water vapor. As is evident from this graph of the clausius clapeyron relation for water, the saturation vapor pressure over ice, which is the pressure of water vapor in close contact and equilibrium with ice, is only slightly lower than that over liquid water. But it is sufficiently lower to favor the ice crystals over the supercooled water droplets in capturing water vapor from the air. The ice crystals attract the water vapor and grow larger. This reduces the amount of water vapor in the cloud. The air in the cloud becomes drier. The lower vapor pressure causes other supercooled water droplets to also evaporate. And then, as a follow up, the newly formed water vapor to also deposit on the ice crystals. By this positive feedback mechanism, known as the wegener bergeron findeisen process, after German meteorologist Alfred Wegener, Swedish meteorologist Thor Bergeron, and German meteorologist Walter Findeisen, all supercooled water is thus effectively transformed into ice crystals that grow larger and heavier. The feedback is called positive because the process of deposition itself, via another process, evaporation, strengthens the deposition. Also, the ice crystals may collide with other ice crystals and grow larger still through collision coalescence. Eventually, the ice crystals will have grown large and heavy enough to fall from the cloud as snow or ice crystals, or when they melt on their way down as cold rain. 
The wegener bergeron findeisen process is the dominant process for the generation of precipitation from cold clouds in the middle and upper latitudes of the Earth. Besides ice forming nuclei such as salt crystals and particles from forest fires, dust storms, and volcanic eruptions, and micrometeorites, Pseudomonas syringae bacteria have been implicated as highly efficient biological ice making nuclei. These bacteria have been reported in rain, snow, and cloud water samples. Even though the bacteria aren't alive, they still have an ice making protein anchored to their outer cell walls and therefore still form ice. Rising expansion and cooling of air and the formation of clouds by condensation are preliminary steps for the generation of precipitation. The process is leading to the uplift of air and the scale at which these processes act may, however, differ. Following this, a number of different types of precipitation can be distinguished. Precipitation as the result of local heating of the air at the Earth's surface, as shown here, is called convective precipitation. This process is active in tropical areas and in the interior of continents. Convective precipitation is local and often intense, for example, during thunderstorms. When horizontal air currents are forced to rise over natural barriers such as mountain ranges, as shown here, orographic precipitation may occur. Uplift of the air causes precipitation to fall on the windward side of a mountain range. This results in drier air on the descending, often warming, leeward or downwind side of the mountain range, where a precipitation shadow an area without or with only slight precipitation is formed. For instance, California's Saline Valley in Death Valley National Park is a desert valley in the rain shadow of the Sierra Nevada Mountains. When cold and warm air masses meet, frontal precipitation is formed. The cross section AB also shown in plan view below, shows a cold front to the left and a warm front to the right. The cold front and the warm front are part of an anti-clockwise movement of the air around a low pressure area in the Northern Hemisphere. The cold air has a harder job of moving under the warm air at a cold front, then the warm air being lighter has in moving over the cold air at the warm front. Therefore, at a cold front, the advancing cold air forces the warm air to rise along a steep slope, causing rapid lifting and intense rain of short duration. Whereas at a warm front, the advancing warm air easily rides up over the cold air along a gentle slope, causing a gradual lifting and cooling and moderate rainfall of long duration. Finally, as a small addition, if you were to ask someone to draw a picture of a falling raindrop, this person would probably draw a teardrop shape. However, raindrops are not shaped like teardrops at all. Rather, this photo shows that a falling raindrop is flat at the bottom due to the resistance of the air that has to move around the falling raindrop. To the right, the shape of falling raindrops as a function of its diameter is shown. When a raindrop is small, it is roughly spherical due to the surface tension of water, but when it grows larger, it flattens at the bottom, and when it grows even larger, it will split into smaller raindrops.